of the IFR to introduce Mr. Uh, John Ellis. Friends, it is indeed a great privilege for me to introduce Professor John Ellis to this audience. Uh, John, as he is affectionately called by friends and colleagues, is one of the most distinguished theoretical physicists of our times. His long research career spans of the broad canvas from particle physics to astrophysics, cosmology and quantum gravity. His pioneering contributions relating theory to experiment from interpreting measurements and the results of searches of new particles to exploring the physics that could be done with future accelerators are too numerous for me to list here. I'll just give you a couple of examples. He was the first to suggest techniques for finding the gluon in electron positron annihilations. Gluon is the carrier of strong force that binds quarks into protons and neutrons, the constituents of nuclear matter. <coughs> he gave the first estimates of direct CP violation contribution to rare decays. Uh, CP violation, uh, as we just heard, is crucial for the observed excess of matter in the universe which, which makes us possible and this wonderful lecture uh, session possible. He has been an, a great advocate and a major supporter of current and future accelerators. His passion for them arises from their potential to break through as yet barely glimpsed frontiers of nature. For example, he showed how data from SLC and LEP, these are two accelerators, could be used to predict the masses of the top quark and the Higgs, something about which we will hear in an hour's time, less than an hour's time. His pioneering work to make predictions to be verified at future machines has now become a mainstream activity in the, in the area, in the, in the community of particle physicists and it constitutes one of the most important bridges between experimental and theoretical communities. The impact of his work can be glimpsed from the fact that he is among the top few most cited uh, in particle physics and related fields. He has received many awards, I won't list them all here, but mention that he is the recipient of Maxwell Medal and the Paul Dirac Prize by the Institute of Physics and currently he is the Clark Maxwell Professor of Theoretical Physics at King's College London. He is also a strong advocate of involvement of non-European countries including India in scientific activities at the European Laboratory CERN. Today's lecture is a part of his commitment to outreach efforts for which he frequently travels all over the world. So without keeping uh, any further Words, let me invite John to give this Okay. So, uh, my title is uh, Answering Gauguin's Questions with the uh, Large Hadron Collider. So, I would argue that the uh, Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, is a... Uh, The Hadron Collider is uh, probably the world's biggest uh, scientific laboratory, at least the biggest one constructed by people. It's a little bit smaller than the universe, but not that much. Uh, here you see the outline of the Large Hadron Collider ring. It's about 27 kilometers in circumference. Uh, you get some idea of the physical scale by comparing it with the uh, airport of uh, the runway of Geneva Airport. So a tremendous amount of effort has been put into constructing this scientific experiment and uh, my job is to try to explain to you why. And uh, I take as my uh, theme or text uh, this uh, famous painting by Gauguin. So the people in this picture are asking themselves some very fundamental questions about our universe and the stuff that it contains. Uh, they ask the questions in French, if I translate it to English. Uh, they are, where do we come from, what are we, and 
where are we going? And uh, I would argue that uh, the aim of particle physics is uh, the aim of experiments at CERN, the aim of the LHC experiments in particular, is to uh, try to answer those questions, at least in the language of fundamental physics. Simply stated, you know, our job is to understand what the universe is made of. So if I translate Gogan's questions into particle physics language, uh, what are we, becomes the question, what is matter made of? Okay, we all have some ideas about what it's made of, atoms and so on, and our job is to delve deep inside those atoms and try to understand the fundamental constituents. Now there's a corollary issue here, which is why do things weigh? Uh, we all know that uh, weight is proportional to mass, but what we physicists do not yet understand is where the mass comes from. Uh, in two hours' time, we may know a lot more. Uh, there was a discussion after the previous uh, talk about the origin of matter. How was matter created? Well, Russian physicist Safarov had certain ideas as to how that might have happened, and one of the objectives of large hydro provider experiments is to try to cast light on this Safarov mechanism. We've heard a lot this afternoon about dark matter. Dark matter may be made of particles, possibly particles that we can produce at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, for example, if there were once in thermal equilibrium in the Earth universe, as Dick suggested at the end of his talk, then I think there's good chances that we may observe them at the Large Hadron Collider. <coughs> How does the universe evolve? Well, you've heard about this. It evolves according to uh, Einstein's equations, uh, at least until a couple of months ago. Uh, the question is, what do you put into those equations and how do you solve those equations? That depends on the type of matter that you have. For example, uh, the issue of cosmological inflation, which you've heard about. Uh, many models of cosmological inflation are based on the idea that there is some sort of elementary scalar field energy. It would be nice to discover at least one elementary looking scalar field. Maybe two hours time. We have discovered one. Are there additional dimensions of space? This is also an idea which was mentioned earlier on. Again, something which is very fashionable in the context of uh, attempts to unify the fundamental interactions. So, as I said, I would argue that uh, the job of particle physicists is to ask at least all these questions and hopefully provide at least some of the answers. Okay, so uh, let's start off by looking at a typical piece of matter. Uh, I'd like to dispel one uh, confusion that sometimes people have. Uh, with particle accelerators, we're not studying some sort of abstract laboratory concept of matter. We're actually studying what this stuff is made of. And uh, what we know is made of atoms. Atoms contain electrons orbiting very small nuclei. Those nuclei are made out of protons and neutrons. Uh, those in turn are made up out of quarks. And it's interesting to sort of go down the uh, microcosmic distance scale. Uh, basically, when we're talking about quarks, experiments with quarks at the Large Hadron Collider, we are as deep inside the nucleus as the nucleus is inside the atom. And we're trying to understand what these fundamental constituents of matter are and what are the fundamental forces between them. So a lot of the progress in, this, in the first half of the last century was uh, made using cosmic ray experiments. It was the first connection between the cosmos and the microcosmos. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Hess, almost exactly a century ago, going up in the balloon, and he discovered that there was uh, ionizing radiation coming from outer space, so-called cosmic rays, and when they collide with the upper atmosphere, they produce many new types of particles. Uh, much of the studies of particle physics in the first half of the 20th century was using these cosmic ray collisions. However, around the middle of the last century, physicists realized that if they want to study these properties in more detail, they have to observe them under controlled laboratory conditions, and that was where the idea of using particle accelerators was born. So what progress has been made over the past half century? Well, we have developed uh, the so-called standard model of particle physics, 
which was uh, proposed in the 1960s by Abdul Salam from Pakistan, uh, Nash Alan Weinberg. And uh, there are many crucial tests of their ideas that were performed at uh, CERN and other accelerator laboratories. And I think it's fair to say that a very large number of experiments agree very well with the standard model of particle physics to a per mil, in some cases, far better accuracy. So what is this standard model? So at the top here you see the uh, roster of elementary particles of matter. You see on the left uh, the six quarks, the fundamental nuclear uh, particles. Uh, on the left you see the electron, a couple of heavier charged particles that do not have nuclear interactions. And you see the three species of neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos of course have been very much in the news recently. So there are four fundamental forces uh, that we know about uh, on these particles. Uh, two of them, of course, are very familiar from everyday life, gravity and electromagnetism. But in addition, inside the nucleus, you have the strong force that holds it together, uh, carried by the gluon, and you have the weak force responsible for radioactivity, uh, which is carried by heavy particles called W. That's why the weak force is weak, because the carrier particles are very heavy. But uh, that, of course, poses the question, how and why are those particles so heavy? And that, as I said, is one of the primary issues uh, that we're currently addressing with experiments at CERN. So, so I'd like to, see, like to think of what you see on this slide uh, as representing, in some sense, the cosmic DNA. Uh, these particles, their properties, somehow encode all the information needed to produce all the visible stuff in the universe. <coughs> Notice how visible stuff dark stuff? That's another question. Okay, so as I've already mentioned a couple of times, one of the big problems, outstanding issues that we have with the standard model is why do particles weigh? So uh, Newton, of course, told us that weight is proportional to mass. Einstein told us that energy is related to mass by equals mc squared. Uh, unfortunately, these two distinguished gentlemen somehow forgot to explain where the mass comes from in the first place. And that's where this guy comes in, Mr. Higgs. He's got a theory which is uh, written on the blackboard behind him. You probably can't see it, uh, but maybe you can see my t shirt. So the top line of the t shirt describes the fundamental interactions, or basically generalizations of Maxwell's equations. Uh, the second line describes how those forces act on matter particles inside. Uh, those two top lines are completely established by experiment with extremely high confidence. The two bottom lines, those are at the moment purely hypothetical. That is Mr. Higgs's idea for how particles acquire their mass. According to this theory, there is a universal field phi, which you can see on my t-shirt. And associated with that field phi, there is a quantum, that's the Higgs boson, so-called, which well, as I like to advertise the fact that not only was Maxwell a professor at King's College, Cambridge, at King's College London, but uh, Peter Higgs was a student at King's College London. Anyway, so he's given his name to this Higgs boson, which has in some sense become uh, the holy grail of us particle physicists. So, I'd like to propose uh, a way of thinking about this Higgs idea, and uh, I hope you don't mind if I propose an analogy which is completely inappropriate to Mumbai. <laughs> Think of an infinite flat field of snow. This is the analogue of the Higgs field. It's uh, featureless, it's universal, it's isotropic, it's homogeneous, Think Siberia. Now suppose that you try to travel through this medium. Now if you're clever, you can have skis, and you can go skimming across the top of the snow, so you don't really interact with the snow. Uh, ski, you travel very fast, that's a bit like a particle that travels at the speed of light. A photon, maybe. But supposing you don't have skis, supposing you have snowshoes, then you sink somewhat into the snow, you go more slowly because you interact with that Higgs snow field, travel at less than the speed of light, that's like a particle with mass, an electron maybe. 
the electron didn't have mass, there wouldn't be any atoms. Or maybe you're just trying to walk through the snow with the shoes. Well, that's not a good idea. You're going to interact very strongly with that Higgs snow field. You're going to go very slowly, and that's like a particle with a very large mass. Now, you can carry this analogy further. What's snow made of? Well, it's made of snowflakes. So in some sense, you can regard the Higgs boson, the quantum of the Higgs field, as being the uh, snowflake of this somewhat flaky idea. <laughs> now, you can even push this analogy further. So a snowflake is a very complicated object. In fact, no two snowflakes are identical. That's because it's a composite <laughs> object. It could also be that what we think of as being an elementary Higgs boson is actually a composite object as a whole you know, gazillion big family of Higgs-like particles waiting to be discovered. So I, I like to think of the state of particle physics, the standard model being a little bit like a room. We think there's something beyond the standard model outside the room, but we can't see it because there are no windows. But there's a door. That door is called the Higgs, and when we open it, maybe we're going to discover wonderful new physics beyond it. And that is you know, basically the stage at which particle physics is poised at this moment. So, so one of the things that might lie behind it is the particles that make up the dark matter. So you've heard a lot from my astrophysical and cosmological colleagues about the motivations for dark matter. I don't need to repeat them. What I would just like to say is that it might be made up of particles which, if they were in equilibrium in the Earth universe, are quite likely to be uh, produced at the Large Hadron Collider. And one of my personal favorites are things called supersymmetric particles, uh, but you know, there are other candidates also. Now, another topic of investigation at uh, CERN, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider and elsewhere, is the nature of antimatter. Of course, ever since Star Trek, uh, antimatter has become a very uh, popular subject, and uh, Tom Hanks also contributed to the popularity. Uh, I should make it perfectly clear that at CERN we don't make enough antimatter to uh, be interesting to Star Trek, or enough to blow up the Vatican. <laughs> However, maybe the studies we do of antimatter could love to cast light on the issue of where the matter in the universe comes from. So uh, this is Dirac, who in the 1920s postulated the existence of antimatter. Uh, he thought it was going to be exactly equal and opposite from conventional matter. Uh, in 1932, Anderson discovered antimatter positrons in the cosmic rays. Subsequently, antimatter has been studied in great detail in accelerators, and it's even now used in thousands of hospitals around the planet for medical diagnosis. Now, in the studies of antimatter, it actually came as a big surprise when experiments discovered that antimatter is actually quite, not quite equal and opposite from regular matter. Gravity is the same, the electric charge is opposite, but the weak interactions, it's more complicated. And this gave rise to Sakharov's suggestion that this small difference between matter and antimatter might explain the dominance of matter in the universe today. And there is a dedicated experiment at CERN uh, which is trying to understand more about this matter antimatter difference. Now, of course, one of the other aspirations that we particle physicists have, we've had it ever since um, Einstein, is to uh, unify the fundamental interactions. So uh, here he is, I don't know how old he is here, about 10 maybe. Uh, I like to fancy that he looks a little bit sad, uh, maybe because he had a premonition that he would never succeed in making a unified theory. Uh, this blackboard does not have a unified theory on it. However, at least one of the ideas that Einstein worked a lot with in his later life uh, could turn out to be interesting for making such a unified theory. That's the idea that there might be additional dimensions of space. This is again something which we are exploring with the Large Hadron Collider. Now, since the previous talks of uh, mainly concerned cosmology, 
I thought I'd like to make a small connection with uh, some of the topics that we discussed earlier on. So we, we heard a lot about the cosmic microwave background radiation. That was released when atoms were formed something like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. So before then, there were no atoms, no chemistry, and half what you write, no biology, and no cosmologists. If you go back before when the universe was about three minutes old, there would have been no nuclei. Instead, you would just had protons and neutrons, no nuclear physicists. If you go back before one microsecond, even protons and neutrons, the universe would have been so hot and so dense that they would have been melted and you'd have had just a soup of quarks and gluons, another one of the subjects which we're exploring with the Large Hadron Collider. If you go back when the universe was on picosecond old, that's when we think that the Higgs mechanism may have kicked in and particle masses might have appeared. So how about dark matter? This is the question at the end of the previous lecture. Uh, in these ideas where dark matter was previously in thermal equilibrium with the visible matter, uh, it would have been uh, released, decoupled from regular matter, sometime between one picosecond and one microsecond. And how about appearance of matter through this matter antimatter asymmetry? That could have occurred as late as one picosecond. It might have occurred earlier. It requires some uh, glitch in the expansion of the universe. And the latest glitch that we know about is this phase transition accompanying the formation of uh, particle masses. So, those are just some instances of uh, the general uh, truism that uh, if you go back earlier and earlier in the history of the universe, smaller and smaller, you also go back. Just hope I get through the remaining 10 minutes or so without the need for backup. Okay, so we go back to very early times, uh, very small the size of the universe, high temperatures, uh, the energies of the constituents of the universe would have been related to the temperature, just to put in some units. Uh, the energies, typical energies, would have been in the MeV range when temperature was of the order of 10 billion degrees, which would have been when the universe was about one second old. <laughs> Clear that if you want to understand what happened before then, you're going to need particle physics, you're going to need to understand the properties of fundamental particles. So that's where the Large Hadron Collider comes in. So this is a picture of uh, what goes on uh, in that tunnel, 27 kilometers of circumference, on average 100 meters underground. And uh, what you can uh, maybe make out here are some of the thousands of magnets which guide the particles around in a circle and bring them into collision. Some of those magnets, I may say, uh, were produced here in India. So, thousands of billions of protons go around in opposite directions. Each of them has approximately the energy of a fly. Uh, they're traveling a bit less than the speed of light. Uh, 99.999991% of the speed of light, and they go around that ring something like 11,000 times per second. And uh, fortunately, passport controls between Switzerland and France have been abolished, so they don't have to show their passports 11,000 times a second. So, principal scientific objectives understand the origin of mass, nature of dark matter, primordial plasma that fill the universe, and matter antimatter and symmetry. Okay, so since uh, this afternoon has this sort of astrophysical cosmological theme, uh, I can't resist pointing out that uh, inside these magnets we have vacuum tubes, and those vacuum tubes have, perhaps it's not the emptiest space in the solar system, but certainly the pressure in those tubes has to be less than on the surface of the moon, otherwise the particles going around would hit gas and not each other at the points of collision. I would also claim that the Large Hadron Collider is cooler than outer space. So uh, here's a picture of uh, part of the uh, refrigeration system. Uh, that cools the magnets down to less than two degrees above absolute zero. It's not quite as cool as Planck, but it is 
cooler than the microwave background radiation, which I remind you, you've seen the pictures earlier on, has a temperature of 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So uh, we are 0.8 degrees cooler than cosmology. So here's a cutaway picture of the Large Hadron Collider. So here we get is a tunnel, on average 100 meters underground. And there are four points around the ring where we bring the circulating particles into collision. And at each of those points, there is uh, one major experiment and uh, often a, a one or two uh, minor experiments also. So what happens when the protons or the nuclei collide? Well, for one very brief instant, you produce what might be one of the hottest places in the galaxy. Uh, for a very, very brief instant, you have a very small region of space that is perhaps a billion times hotter than the center of the sun. So what happens? Well, of course, the energy of the colliding particles is converted into new particles that are produced. Uh, energy is converted maybe into the mass of the Higgs boson, or the mass of those massive cold dark matter particles. So, around each of these collision points, uh, there is a, a large detector. Uh, when I say large, I mean large. <laughs> this is a, a person here, okay, it's not a, a Lego person, okay, that's, that's a real person. And uh, he is standing in the middle of what actually is the largest uh, of the LHC detectors called Atlas. He's looking for Higgs and supersymmetry. So, uh, the big rival from Atlas is the CMS experiment over here, also looking for Higgs and supersymmetry. Then there's an experiment called ALICE, dedicated to looking at the nature of the quark gluon plasma, filled the university when it was very young. And over here, this is a dedicated experiment looking at the matter antimatter difference. So, I already mentioned that uh, India uh, contributed to the Large Hadron Collider itself. It's also made important contributions to both the ALICE and the CMS experiment, and uh, Indian physicists are now uh, active in uh, analyzing the data coming out of the LHC. So now I'd just like to show you uh, a sequence of pictures showing the installation of uh, one of those detectors in its uh, cavern, uh, think about 80 meters underground, and the cavern has a volume similar to that of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And uh, what you see here are these silver tubes with the orange stripes, those are actually parts of the magnet system. And uh, this is the picture taken when the construction of the magnet is complete, and this is part of the <coughs> internal detector uh, looking for the particles that are being produced. And uh, now maybe it's easier to see the person to set the scale. Uh, the diameter is about 25 meters, the length is uh, almost 50 meters. And uh, this experiment, like CMS, has uh, about 3,000 scientists and engineers who have been involved in constructing and operating it, uh, including something like 1,000 PhD students from dozens of countries. So, uh, new students out there, uh, we hope to see some of you uh, in future years working on the Large Hadron Collider. Now, uh, we saw a roulette wheel at the end of the previous talk, and we also heard previously that uh, Kip is a bit of a gambler. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the whole LHC project is a bit of a gamble. Okay. We bring these particles into collision at very high energies, but we do not know what they're going to produce. Now, we have some ideas, don't know. So uh, doing the experiments is a little bit like uh, watching the roulette wheel and uh, who knows, maybe we'll discover the Higgs boson. This is an example of what a Higgs boson event might look like. It's a computer simulation. So in the simulation, uh, two protons collided along this axis here, produce a bunch of charged particles that you can see. You can't see Higgs boson because it's a neutral particle that's unstable, but it decays into other particles that you can see. In this particular case, an electron-positron pair over here and a muon pair 
over there. So that's an example of the sort of thing that the experiments are looking for, and uh, in an hour or so, uh, we may know what they're currently finding. Of course, you know, the roulette wheel might also reveal other things. Uh, supersymmetry, for example, that's one of those theories of dark matter that I mentioned. And uh, this is an example of what a, a dark matter event might look like. So, uh, this is a, a view across the detectors. You have to imagine that the proton beams are going into and out of the screen. So, there's something funny about this event because there's a lot of energetic particles coming over this side, but nothing very much over the other side. It looks like energy momentum is not balanced. It looks like there's a, a missing transverse momentum or energy going off in this direction. And in this simulation, that's because it's carried away by invisible dark matter particles. And uh, this is just one example of a real event observed by CMS, the previous thing was a simulation. And here you see you know, all these energetic particles coming out in the top part of the detector, but nothing very much in the bottom part. Is this due to the production of dark matter particles? Quite frankly, probably not. It's probably just the production of neutrinos. But this is an example of the sort of events that uh, the experimentalists are now looking through to try to see whether there is something beyond the standard model. What else <coughs> might we let real reveal? Extra dimensions, maybe? So, in some theories with extra dimensions, gravity becomes strong at the LHC energies, and you might be able to produce primordial black holes. Uh, would they eat up the entire Earth? No. Uh, according to the crazy ideas that predict their production, they would also decay instantaneously. And of course, you shouldn't be the theorists. You should remember that we are being bathed in cosmic rays, have been bathed in cosmic rays for billions of years. Many of those cosmic rays have energies much bigger than the LHC, and we're still here. So uh, you don't have to worry about uh, being destroyed <coughs> tomorrow by a black hole. Okay, so there was uh, big excitement uh, in 2008 when uh, the Large Hadron Collider was uh, started up for the first time. Uh, something like a, a billion people are thought to have watched the startup on uh, the TV news. Uh, of course, nowadays that's not a true measure of fame. The true measure of fame is being uh, given free publicity by Google. <laughs> now, somehow, I suspect that that billion people were not so much concerned about the Higgs boson or dark matter, uh, <coughs> but they may be concerned about those black holes. <laughs> Which all goes to prove there's no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> what could be worse publicity than blowing up the planet? <laughs> okay, so here are some uh, physicists, they're very concentrated, they're very anxious, they're very tense, they're anticipating. Uh, Actually, these people are watching a World Cup football game. <laughs> these are the physicists who are watching the startup of the LHC. Um, this one looks particularly nervous. But it's okay. Um, everybody here looks extremely happy. Uh, apart from her. <laughs> And I'm told that uh, she was the person with her finger on the red button with the job of stopping it if something went wrong. <laughs> so she's concentrating on her job. So this is why they're so happy. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the first high energy collision seen uh, by the uh, Atlas experiment. So uh, the proton beams collided along this axis here. They produced a bunch of charged particles. You can see the tracks coming out and uh, also some of the particles deposited their energy in the outer parts of the detector. Uh, all the different parts of the detector 
continue to be working fine. So this is one example of uh, an event that was seen last year. So basically, last year was devoted to rediscovering all the known physics, all the known particles, and uh, this is one of the heaviest known particles, and uh, you see it's produced thousands of them, everything looks to be in agreement with the standard model. Of course, what we really want to do is to find something beyond the standard model, and specifically to try to understand how mass might have been created. So uh, here is the first Higgs event seen at the NHC. This is uh, Peter Higgs visiting the experiment. And uh, this is a, a real event, which is an example of the sort of thing that the experimentalists are now looking for. So this is the same Z particle that we saw earlier on, but in this case it's produced with additional missing energy, maybe due to another Z particle, and one of the favourite ways for the Higgs to decay is into a pair of Z particles. So conceivably, this could be uh, a Higgs event, but only time will tell. Okay, so this is probably the most technical slide that I'm going to show. And this is uh, a summary of the state of the search for the Higgs uh, as it was announced last month. There was no uh, evidence for Higgs boson. Uh, instead, what you see here as a black line is the experimental upper limit on Higgs production, compared with the standard model prediction, which is this horizontal dashed line. So where the black line goes below the dashed line, that means you've got an upper limit on Higgs production below what you calculate in the standard model, that means that you can't have a standard model Higgs in that range. But you could have a heavy standard model Higgs, or you could have a light standard model Higgs. Now, I would argue that this picture actually already tells us that there has to be new physics beyond the standard model. Because supposing that you're over on the right-hand side, got a very heavy Higgs boson, that gives us all sorts of problems with understanding the highly precise data that we've gathered over the last 20 years, and also the theory itself tends to uh, blow up to try to calculate things. How about in the middle? Well, in the middle, it's uh, less than the standard model Higgs, and so you need some additional physics in order to complete Higgs's job. How about the left-hand side? So you notice there's some interesting little wiggles over here. Uh, in that particular case, it turns out that our electric vacuum is unstable, and actually our vacuum should decay at some point in the future. Not, not next week, but maybe in a hundred billion years. So as many of you know, uh, an update is uh, planned for uh, later on today. There's going to be a seminar at CERN with the latest results from the Atlas and, and CMS experiments. And I strongly advise you to look very carefully in this mass region here to see whether any of these wiggles turn out to be anything real. That's not a problem. That's just to say that we haven't seen any black holes. experiments, including, uh, as you can see here, over a hundred from India. And uh, it was precisely in order to enable those tens of thousands of scientists to collaborate that uh, Tim Berners-Lee, then working at CERN, invented the World Wide Web uh, 22 years ago. So physicists, in some sense, were the first online community. 
So I hope that I've convinced you that uh, the LHC may revolutionize fundamental physics, but it may also change our view of the universe. Uh, for example, by revealing to us the nature of dark matter, or by telling us where the matter in the universe comes from. But before Spencer gets up again, one glass. So back in 1982, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, then Prime Minister of England, came to visit. She's the one on the right. <laughs> to a bunch of British physicists. What do you do, young man? <laughs> so I explain, well, I'm a theoretical physicist, and my job is to think of things for the experiments to look for, and I, I hope they find something different. So Mrs. Thatcher didn't really understand this, because Mrs. Thatcher liked things to be the way she wanted them to be. Wouldn't it be better if they found what you predicted, young man? So I said, well, if they just found exactly what we predicted, then we wouldn't really feel we were learning anything. So in somewhat the same sense, I hope that the LHC will go down in history for discovering something that I've not discussed in this talk. Because it's the group of isometries on space-time. And regarding every other symmetry group has been done, 
So my question is, is this distinction artificial? In other words, can we formulate physics in such a way so that we only deal with the base manifolds of these D groups and not talk about space time at all? So, uh, when I was uh, about your age, uh, one of the big uh, things that the theory of physics were trying to do was precisely to combine those internal symmetry groups with the Planck group. Uh, and this all collapsed. It didn't work. However, uh, in 1970, 71, people discovered how to do it. And the answer is that you have to use uh, so called fermionic symmetries. Supersymmetry. And uh, this is something that impressed me very much at the time. I didn't see any use of it, but later on in the 1980s, 1990s, I got convinced that this is not only interesting but also useful. So the answer to your, make, your question may well be provided by the searches for supersymmetry at the edge. Thank you. Uh, how do you estimate temperatures at these at the mic at the LHC? Uh, as in our traditional definitions of temperatures we know wouldn't work there. As in, in the sense of temperature fluctuation, uh, energy fluctuations, kinetic energy fluctuations. How do you estimate temperatures? Okay, so uh, of course I, I cheated a little bit, okay? <laughs> if I intended to equate energy uh, with temperature. Now, if you're colliding with every nuclei in the LHC, you form what is by particle physics standard a relatively extended system. Okay, and there I think the concept of temperature can be applied, and people have measured the abundance of the different types of particles coming out, and they pretty much agree with you know, the expected Boltzmann factors. Now, when you collide two protons, that, that simple thermal picture presumably does not apply. Okay? Uh, but you produce particles with certain energies, and those energies correspond naively to certain temperatures. It's one of the puzzles of particle physics is that actually things look thermal even when they shouldn't. Uh, it's true, I was cheating. We've got, we've got breaking of parity symmetry. We've got lots of questions from this side, but nobody gets a microphone on so, the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question would be can we uh, employ the LLC to relevant to the uh, fundamental nature of space and time. Can it reveal any, are there any theoretical conjectures for the fundamental nature of space and time? What are the different theories? Uh, and another question would be, out of, out of the four fundamental forces of nature, why does gravity interact with space and time? Oof. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course, uh, There are ways of testing out, of course theoretical physicists are you know, imagining you know, ways of extending or abolishing or relativizing the concepts of space and time. And, uh, Professor Wadio is certainly amongst the leaders in that particular uh, direction. Now, now whether one can test those ideas at the LHC I think depends crucially on the scale at which gravity becomes strong. So we know that gravity depends on couples to mass, actually it doesn't. Actually, gravity comes into energy. Okay. So, you know, if you're talking about the energy of a typical elementary particle, the force of gravity on that is incredibly weak. Okay. 10 to the minus 40. Now, there are some ideas with extra dimensions in which that force uh, grows very rapidly with energy. It might actually become strong at the TeV energy's characteristic of the LHC. Now, if that were to happen, then you might be able to explore uh, the nature of space and time. For example, if particles were described by strings at that level, uh, then you might get some sort of window into the behavior of space and time. But, but for me, that's a, a very speculative idea. I think that you know, it's more likely that the extra dimensions are too small to be detected directly in the universe. But, yeah, we'll see. So, we have zero mass particles like photons. Okay? And the massive particles, say, those are positive masses. Why not negative masses? Why is this asymmetry is there? Mass asymmetry. We have zero masses, positive masses, why not negative masses? Okay. Which we gravitationally, so the opposite behavior, like 
So, in fact, what is relevant is not actually the mass. The mass is squared. Okay, uh, this is actually mentioned by one of your colleagues. Um, this is the Casimir of the, the group. Right? So that means actually positive masses and negative masses are essentially equivalent. Okay, technical issues there, but let's forget about that. However, what is relevant, what is important, and physically you know, it's very distinctive, is whether m squared is positive or negative. So all the particles that we know have m squared zero or positive. Now, people have conjectured that there might be particles with m squared negative, the so-called tachyons. The tachyons can travel faster than the speed of light. So you can just imagine, hundreds of people immediately say, well, could those opera neutrinos be tachyons? The answer is no. Uh, there's various different reasons why they couldn't be. Uh, one of them being that uh, as you accelerate a tachyon, its it speed actually decreases towards the speed of light. So that would mean that if you had a neutrino tachyon, and if it's traveling faster than the speed of light at opera energies, at low energies, it would be traveling far, far bigger than the speed of light. And that we know is not the case. My, co my question was just like. We have two types of charges, positive and negative. Light charges repel, unlike charges attract. Yeah. In gravity, I think of light masses should attract and uh, this unlike masses should repel each other. Well, gravity is like this is maybe something we should discuss in private. But gravity works differently from electricity. Distinguishes between positive and negative charges. Gravity is always positive. That's the theory. Quite this Okay, thank you. the last question there. You throw out like kilobytes and kilobytes of data every second, right? And uh, how do you know information that you're looking for is not from there? I mean, you don't know where the information is right now, right? And uh, also, there are so many collisions happening per second. How do you hold it on one single collision? Like, how do you know which collision you are talking about? Uh, right. Okay, so, so the experiments uh, produce uh, petabytes of data per second. Uh, I was chuckling a little bit when you were talking about your know, data. So, so obviously, you, know, you cannot record petabytes of data per second. You can hope to record petabyte petabytes of data per year. And actually the LHC experiments between them store something like 10 petabytes of information per year. So you have to reduce uh, by a factor of a million or 10 million. So you have to be very selective in which uh, events you decide to keep, which ones you just discard. So it's a little bit like taking pictures with a camera. Uh, you know, you take pictures of the digital camera, 10 megapixels. You've got 150 megapixel detectors. The difference is, of course, that we take uh, pictures every 50 nanoseconds. People don't take pictures quite so often. But then people, when they take their pictures home, then they say, oh, well, grandma's got her tongue out in this picture. We'll throw that one away. Right. So you, you down-select, okay? Now, we have to down-select two. We have to down-select in a fraction of a second and by a factor of a million. Okay. Now, obviously, this is not done by people looking to see whether grandma's smiling or not. This is done by computers that are programmed to look for events which are a priori interesting. So, we've got a high energy collider, we're interested in converting that high energy into high masses. High masses mean the high energies of the particles to which they decay. So, it's programmed to look for events with high energy quarks, high energy electrons, high energy muons, and so on. Now, of course, if we're wrong, and if there's some interesting low mass particle that we hadn't thought of, which is being produced by the LHC, we're not going to see it. But things like the Higgs and dark matter, we would see. And what about, uh, how do you hold it on one collision? Uh, there must be a number of collisions happening per second, right? Right. And, you, and you're uh, detecting it using detectors. How do you know which collision? Uh, right. So, uh, there is an internal clock in the detector which takes a picture at the moment every 50 nanoseconds, perhaps next year, once every 25 nanoseconds. 
So you like like clicking the camera shutter okay, once every 15 nanoseconds. Now there's a complication, which is that uh, so the beams pass through each other once every 15 nanoseconds. Actually, on average, when they pass through each other, they produce something like 20 collisions. So it's again, to come back to this uh, home photography analogy, it's a little bit like every time you took a picture of uh, the gateway to India, you got 20 pictures of the gateway to India, and you have to select which is the interesting one. Out of the 20 that you took at the same time, once every 15 seconds. How do you know which part goes So, so you've got these 20 events you know, which are produced at the same time. So uh, your detector can say, okay, there was an energetic electron there. So we keep that event and we look at it later. Then later on, you can look at it either by computer or by eye, and you would actually see that these 20 collisions are actually occurring in quite the same place. They're strung out like beads on a string. And so you can see, this is the one, the fifth one along the line, which had the energetic electron. Let's see what else it had. I think uh, on that note, uh, we can uh, end this lecture. Thank John again. I don't think you give a hand to all the lecturers for this uh, fantastic afternoon. Thank you all for coming and being so interested in science. I have one last announcement from, the, uh, from some of my colleagues. Look for Chai and Y on Facebook. Once again, look for Chai and Y on Facebook. That's one of the outreach programs of the TIFR.